this is the Man Alone Show. I'm your host, Man Alone. Thank you for coming here to hear all about solo role-playing and solo role-playing accessories. Uh, Today we're talking about something that is, um, you know, I think fairly obvious, and that is that the title of this video is Clickbait. Uh, I, uh, I do not believe that you should throw away your dice um, I did that to increase views uh, and to trick people into watching it. And so now that you know that I deceived you, I understand that you want to leave. But you have to admit that me being upfront about this at the beginning of the video indicates that there is hope for me, that there is a path of rege- uh, redemption, that I am changing, that I am growing, and that with your support, um, I can. I can stop being so deceitful and live more in my truth. So if you want to if you want to navigate away from this video because you're like I don't like being deceived, I totally get it. That said, you're failing me. You know, you you I could have this this moral turn towards the good now and you're leaving and so I'll just continue my evil ways. Um but you know, just to to satisfy those who do want a little bit of an adrenaline rush uh, to pretend for a minute that this video is in fact what the title of it is let's uh, l- let me just try this okay here we go uh hey you like throwing dice yeah um throwing dice uh you could throw these right in the trash how about that uh it's all about using cards and rpgs okay when it comes to playing tabletop role-playing games especially solo games uh these are 2008 and these are 2000 and late they never even give you the numbers you want. Watch this. Oh, I hope I get a seven. Okay, that was actually scared me for a second. Oh. Um, anyways, yeah, collect all your dice and throw them in a big trash pile and then and then throw that trash pile into a bigger trash pile and then throw that into a uh, swamp and then, and then um, you know, relax afterwards because you did a lot of work. Speaking of dice that you sh- definitely shouldn't get, I uh, just want to give a shout out once again to the Newell Dice, which it looks like uh, Tower House Creative is renewing their supply on Etsy. Uh, if you watch my cyborg playthrough, these are very effective uh, in generating NPC and enemy dispositions. I had a lot of fun with that, actually. They work great. And of course, they make the Fate Mill. Uh, and my, my favorite little buddies, the Dyadic D20, uh, they all come with a little cute hologram sticker, a little bit of a story attached to each of them. It's a great buy, um, and a uh, link is below. If you haven't left yet, if you're still here and you haven't given up on me, uh, and after this video you say, I, I, want, I want this man to be part of my life. You can, of course, uh, follow my weekly podcast on buymeacoffee.com forward slash man alone, where I post a weekly podcast where me and friends, um, friends and lovers, uh, we discuss all things gaming, uh, video gaming, tabletop gaming, and uh, I guess, surprisingly, movies is starting to become a thing. And it's true, me and uh, co-host 55 are a bit of cinephiles, uh, and so you can go ahead and check that out. It's four bucks a month, and you can also become a member of the YouTube channel, which will give you a waffle badge. And what is that supposed to represent? Well, it represents exactly what I'm doing right now and why uh, the first three minutes of my video usually results uh, analytics-wise in about a 50% drop in viewers is that it takes me quite a while to get to the point. Uh, But those that are still here are people that can tolerate a bit of dialogue and aren't so greedy for content. And science, um, the scientists have shown that those who complete my videos uh, on average live 50 years longer than other people. Okay, satire. So we're going to be talking about cards today and ooh, ow, uh, just bang my knee using cards in tabletop gaming, specifically solo gaming as a tool. We'll go over some of the different types of cards, some of the ways to use them, some of the ways I've used them, um, some ways that are good, that are not so good maybe. And uh, we can take a look at some newer tools that I got as well. Um, 
So a little bit of a backstory. Uh, this is my story. Hello, my name is Man Alone. And my story is that when I first started playing, uh, I remember that I hated the idea of using cards in a uh, tabletop game of any kind of solo games because for me, in my mind, using cards was something that you did in Uno and Skip Bow and Trivial Pursuit. And the fun, as we know, the fun of any board game is throwing them bones, right? And so I didn't want uh, cards to get in the way of that. It was actually the reading of a tabletop game that I ended up not loving. And in fact, uh, if you were an early watcher of my show, you saw me uh, agonizing over whether or not or when I was going to do a playthrough of Colossal, which I ended up not doing, and then in a huff sold them and now kind of regret that. Um, but I, as I read through it, I started to warm up to the idea of, of using cards, even to the point that an early iteration of a game uh, one of my games that is in uh, cryogenic freezing right now, She Is Your Queen, which I looked at that the other day, and I was like, this is like 70 pages of really good stuff that I shouldn't have just shelved, um, but that's neither here nor there. I incorporated the, the use of playing cards, and that's probably the most basic uh, type of cards uh, and, and the most widely used cards as... Uh, randomizing factors in a game would just be a set of 52 playing cards. Um, and these are, or 54 if you include the jokers. And these are ones that I overpaid for. They were like premium. And now that I got them, I said, why, why did I get premium cards? Um, but, you know, cards like this, uh, they offer a lot of... Um, they're a very clean way to organize things in solo play, especially for table generators. Um, you have the different, you, ha you know, you have the four factors of color as well as suits. You have numbers, you have letters, uh, you, you even have graphical representations. Now that's not as standardized between cards, so it's harder to use those. Uh, but generally I think cards offer a lot of options and when done correctly, uh, you could still get quite a thrill from like just pulling exactly the card that you need. And so there's a lot of good examples of this. I mentioned Colossal. Um, a lot of other solo games are starting to have generators to use cards instead of dice. Um, for example, I previewed this in a picture the other day, Station Zeno. And this is a Mothership solo supplement that I'd never seen before. And this is just a little bit of a side. We'll do a video on this. But I I could have sworn I saw it before. But I was like, I can't remember this. But where did I see it? And I it was before I had Mothership. So that couldn't have been it. And I found out in 2022, this was released, same game, as a Death in, St uh, Death in Space supplement by Stockholm Cartel. And even though it now says it's customized for Mothership, as I read through this, first of all, there's a bunch of places in here that ask for a 1D5 roll, which I actually have a 1D5. It, it came in a set of very odd dice. Um, and it's not like rocket science to figure out how to do a 1D5, but uh, that's just a very strange thing to put in with no instructions. But like I said, this is actually a pretty cool looking supplement and they have you know this card generator here to, to generate different locations inside the space station. Also, the NPCs have stat letters that uh, they do not explain. There's a stat of W, but anyways, we'll, we'll talk about that some other time. Um, yeah, so uh, cards are good. I think in that sense, these are very good to be used alongside dice as well when you want there to be um, maybe more of a static display of information, right? Because if I'm using dice as a generator, right, and I roll D66, I roll a 43, um, now, it, you know, you don't have to be a, a genius to go, oh, I have to roll again, but I want to remember this, and I'll pick up some more dice. It is easier very often to, you know, deal out three cards, and you can just have those sitting in front of you, especially if they belong to a generator that needs to be, like, re-referenced, right? 
And so I think there's some really cool possibilities with that. I think we should actually explore the possibilities of that more, especially when there are people who are so fanatical about games like Slay the Spire, which involve card dealing and card generation, uh, and the new one, which I can't remember what it's called now, but it's like Slay the Spire with poker, and it's very good. Um, so yeah, that's that's one you'll see a lot. Uh, another one you will see a lot in solo games, especially solo journaling games, will be the use of tarot. Uh, as a longtime tarot practitioner, I, I'm of two minds on that. It's not like I, you know, worship tarot. Uh, you know anything is only as sacred as you make it um but it is some of the interpretations of the cards are not what i would interpret them as um but this is uh my favorite tarot set right here and obviously tarot is i think in terms of open-ended uh generation is about as good as you can get i mean when you think about it tarot cards are one of like perhaps the most one of the most impressive painting projects of all time each of these and this is the Rider Waithe deck which is like the most common one you see each of these is a painting it's a painting i mean and and there there are how many uh with with major and minor arcana how many paintings are these i always forget this number um 22 major, 56 lesser, so 78 cards. 78 paintings. I mean, you know, a, a person didn't ha didn't make like little tiny paintings. They probably painted a whole canvas. And and even so, if it was little tiny paintings, uh, they would be um, that would be even more impressive, right? And not only do you have the numbers and the suits of the cups and the staff uh, or the wands and the swords uh, and the pentacles or the discs. You also have elements, you have air, fire, earth, and water. You have different meanings in terms of, you know, the actual pictures and the sense you get. And if you're playing a solo game, you're looking to give yourself a, in, especially one that you want to have it be very tech, uh, textured and rich um, and not just sort of procedurally generated like a 4AD kind of thing, something where you want there to be an ability to flesh things out. It's hard to get a better setup here than tarot. I mean, they're just so rich, and it is truly the ambiguity and different possible interpretations that make them so robust because, you know, you can look at this right here and you can say it's, you know, it's like a Rorschach. You could look at this and say, oh, this is three people who just um, are celebrating their lives um, and they are, uh, they've been friends for a long time and they just feel wonderful around each other. And it's just one of those moments where they say, uh, a life well lived, or you can look at it as three co-conspirators who have just made offerings to the blood God, and they are now raising their chalice to the sky. There's all sorts of interpretations from these. Um, and they're also, you know, almost in every tarot deck, there's something that's going to give one official sort of interpretation as well that can generate more thought um but i think that tarot cards uh do the trick very well i think uh, like i said especially in journaling games and of course if you are savvy you know that uh playing cards and tarot cards are from the same genus right this is just a sort of species when i was in rome last year uh i found this card uh, excuse me portuguese carte da gioco um which the Piacentina deck, and this is sort of the missing link, I think, between um, playing cards and tarot, because, um, you know, tarot cards were, if you look in, in Rider Waithe history, they were started as like a card game, you know, just like we use cards now. And if you look at the Piacentina deck, you can kind of see, um, they're a little bit more narrow, but you can sort of see how this is the link now these are much uh, simpler pictures but you still have wands and swords and discs or pentacles right um maybe not as much of the elements involved in this but if you know the elements of these cards you'll be able to abstract that maybe a little bit of fire right there maybe water uh and so 
This is kind of an interesting one as well. I really hate the color scheme and I have, uh, it's terrible to say because this is a very beautiful selection of colors, but for whatever reason, um, whereas the tarot deck, as I'm looking through it, I feel like there's like a new mental image provoked every time I go through a card. There's like a new world that unveils itself in front of me. With the Piacetina deck, I feel, I don't know, uh, how would you say this? I feel like I'm pulling maybe like lo lottery ticket tabs or something like that. Uh, I also have color vision problems, so that's probably why. Here's a little scopa. Si gioca in due quattro con un mazo da... Okay, so it's 40 cards. I de solito i giocatori si contropongono. Cantropogno a copie. Oof. I really need to, to brush up on my Italian here. Okay, so basically it's saying there are four suits. I'm assuming with this word, agi di candosi, scope, carce, denari, set bello e premere. A punteggio nelle prese nominale da lasso. I'll set you. Okay, I'll translate that. Does anyone here speak Italian? Want to give me a, a comment? Un commenta. Um, so, yeah. That's the Piacetina deck. And curious to see if any games use that. Anyways, that's obviously not what you came here to see. Uh, there's nobody in the world who logged onto YouTube and said, I got to get some Piacetina Plastificate content. Um, okay. So that, I think, is a pretty good overview of the, let's say, the broad-based usage of cards, right? These sort of one-size-fits-all, ones that you can feel other than maybe this one. But in terms of playing cards or tarot cards, that's something that you, could, that you can uh, require in a game that is equal to dice. And what I mean by that is when you open up a... A RPG or a solo RPG and it says um, you need a sheet of paper a pencil um, the, you know the normal set of dice maybe d4 d6 d8 d10 12 20 that's something that you go yeah I think that's a reasonable ask of the consumer right it gets a little weird in the games that use the breathless thing where they say oh you got to get a Jenga tower but I still think that's ubiquitous enough such that if, if not everybody has it, um, everybody knows like, oh, I can go to Target and pick that up for like $12 or whatever poor excuse you have for Target in your country. Um, and it gets, I would say, um, you know, I, I, I think that that is a reasonable ask as well. If you ask for playing cards or tarot cards where a person either has them or they know where to get them. This is something I've been puzzling over for a while here. You might have seen these show up. I recently bought a really nice set of dominoes. And I'm like, you know, these should these got to be something we can do with these here as well, especially with um, dungeon generation. I'm wondering if any game uses this because, you know, this one is multicolored. I don't know if multicolored ones are popular enough to say get a multicolored, you know, uh, domino set, but it would also be cool to like add a sort of threat meter here where you gotta like, you know, after you hit four threats, then you can watch your big domino thing roll. Anyways, where was I? Where was I? Okay, so yeah, those are the, the general ones, I think, broad usage. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's any more. Mm, I don't know, maybe, I, I don't, think anyone's going to make an uno deck for cards but I'm, I'm trying to think of like other sets of cards that people would likely have oh you know um uh who was it was it gray army who made a uh a solo system where you can use like your old magic cards which if you ever played magic the gathering you probably have six thousand of those sitting in a box i found that box the other day and I have occasionally found that box while like moving over the years. And every time I open it, I know that I should like go through them. I should sleeve the foils. I should see what the end, but I'm just like, I can't, I'll just play. And I just close the box and I go maybe next year, you know? Um, okay. 
So the next thing is cards that actually come as part of a system. And I have two examples here. This is from Dragonbane and this is from Symbarum, both free league games, uh, similar and also different in certain ways. Another one that I had recently was the uh, Zone Wars and Twilight 2000. All free league games have their own cards. Um, I'm trying to look at my shelf here to see if any other games come included with cards. I think, I don't know if Mouse Ritter does. Oh, how could I be forgetting, actually? I do know one other common set. One second. Okay, so I do not know if uh, Zweihander has cards. I can't remember. It's been a while since I've been in that starter set. And actually, I should check that out uh, recently. I also found another game that comes with a, a widely used, widely accessible card set, which is Ironsworn. Uh, has these asset cards. And I think if I remember correctly, these asset cards too are made to like uh, dry erase on them. They're, you know, have that uh, erasable surface so that you can add different things to them. And maybe I'm making that up, but uh, yeah, this is one that is always in stock at my game store. Yeah, support, right. So you can like list off how battered it is. You can put the name of your vehicle on there, etc. Um, but the other one that I was saying is, is uh, widely available, at, at least in the Man Alone household, is, of course, Loteria. Juego de Loteria is <clears throat> um, basically bingo um, from Mexico. I think it's a lot more fun than bingo because instead of just letters and numbers, you have all of these beautiful cards. This should be like my life's work, actually, now that I think about it. I should make a, a Loteria-based uh, solo game, although that might, well, there are implications for that. <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, Loteria uh, has like these beautiful pictures. La Maceta, La Pera, El Valiente, El Tambor, El Sol. Um, Okay, I'm sorry. I got excited about that because Loteria is one of my favorite games and uh, close friends of mine know that this is a game that I love to play uh, every single one of my birthdays and I also have huge uh, um, pictures of El Catrin and La Dama above my sofa in the living room because these more than anything like represent the masculine and feminine essence just because of my own history with these cards and my own family and experiences. We all wore tuxes while we were growing up is what I'm saying. Okay, uh, sorry, that was that worth it? Time will tell. Um, so yeah, this is a, a good example here is Dragonbane. I think this is a good breakdown of the types of cards you'll see that are, what would we say, bespoke to a game. Um, and of course in the Dragonbane uh, wonderful core set, not starter kit, core set, which you're going to get games. Oh, if you don't have the Dragon Bane core set, and by the way, uh, a dub from 253, I'm curious of how the Dragon Bane course, if it's arrived at and how it's treating you, because these are, I would say, um, this is where I learned that using these kind of cards to generate things are fun, but using cards to f get treats in a game or to get threats is an especially fun excitement, right? It, it almost exceeds for me dice rolling on like an equipment table to be like, okay, one, six, 16, let's see, okay. That means it's a, a gear, okay, I got a lantern, great. There's something really fun about having like this possibility and then you're like, yes, I get to go to the treasure deck and you get a book. Wow, it's like every birthday present you got or gave when you were 20. Come on, something better than a book. A rat, great. That's, I've wanted that for my birthday forever. A rat. What in the world kind of treasure is that? Roll for, e is this a treasure? It's a treasure. Roll for evade. If you fail, you suffer D4. That's not a treasure. All right, cancel this video. This video's over. What? My producer's telling me I have to continue because of our contract. Fine. Um, improvised weapons. This is another good one. This might be one of the things I love the most about Dragonbane 
is putting out imp- like putting out a grid and then just like throwing these cards or throwing tokens around that imp- uh, that signify improvised weapons and just the idea <laughs> another weird first choice oh that old improvised weapon the crevice um, what in the world is going on is this an improvised weapon bats so I got rats and bats how about a patch of dirt have I selected the worst ones in this whole deck? Oh, okay. So they're divided on the back by like their location. So this is forest, cave, in a boiling cauldron. Now there's a good one. Uh, a bucket of soapy water. Maybe right after the cauldron, you kind of douse them out so that you're not, you know, move move your move your crime down from a felony to a misdemeanor. Burning firewood, a viper. That's the best. You know, I, I think that's something that's missing in a lot of uh, RPGs is just slapping someone in the face with a viper and then you roll. Um, and if you like, if you roll a crit, the viper bites at the same minute that they slap a person's face. Here are some adventure seeds. There's nothing in these cards that aren't available in the book, but it just is like kind of gives it a cool effect to shuffle and then pull one of these and you have an adventure seed right there. The one piece of this that I do have mixed feelings on is initiative. In my experience, I haven't, uh, as Marie Kondo would say, this, this has not sparked a lot of joy. I think that I generally prefer to roll dice for initiative. First of all, I swear my camera is uh, slowing down or something. Anyways. If you, uh, like, especially, okay, so you're in a group of three people, and you pull, like, a six, a four, and a one, it just feels weird. Or, or even more like a six, a four, and a nine. Um, and then there's also, like, it eliminates the possibility for tying. Now, what is nice about it is after you go, you can flip this. But in terms of solo play, I would rather, honestly, I would rather do what Morkborg does, which is just roll a d6. If it's one to three, your adversaries go first. If it's four to six, you go first. So that's the one I'm just a little on the fence about. A certain deck of cards that I would love, uh, nay, lust after, but I cannot find them, are Mutant Year Zero, the original core book, has cards for like weapons and artifacts. And finding these old artifacts is both one of the best and most hilarious parts of Mutant Year Zero because this is in this post-apocalyptic space where they have no memory of like civilization that was. And so they find this stuff like a microwave and they are just totally blown away by it. Like, what is this box? It buzzes. It rotates. Like, what could it have done? You know, did it, was it able to, you know, just like create gold or what? And so... Um, I really want those cards because th- I think it would it, it would be a lot of fun flipping those. Uh, the Symbarum cards were an old, not in circulation set of cards uh, that I found. That I have a little bit of a mixed opinion on this. So let's actually compare here. So this is Treasures, and that's a that's about how much I want to read on a card. Right, because if it's more than this, then I start having to be like, why are we fitting this all on a card? Right, the Symbarum cards are, uh, first of all, they are labeled not by any color, but the backs of them do have slightly different backs, which I think every time I have to look at them, I have to flip it over and see one of them, which I don't know, in some small way affects the luck, I guess. Um, and then, okay, so this is like NPCs, a robber. It has all of their stats. You know, this might actually be good in terms of combat, so I think that one's credited. Um, okay, this is different beasts. Yeah, I think it's divided by area as well. So really, these are monsters and traits, but well, let me look at the traits again. I think it was the traits that I had gripe with. Yeah, web, passive, active, passive, reaction, terrify, swift. Um, I suppose, actually, that this might be helpful as well, just in terms of, I mean, this is really the strength of cards. It's just keeping this stuff in front of you so that you have access to it. Um, 
and it depends on a lot of things. It depends, obviously, on your preferences. It depends on if you want to pay money for information that you already have in the book, which, like, unless you have the the solo RPG illness that we have, uh, I don't know if you're going to want to do that. We'll buy six different versions of, of one thing. Uh, but if you're not infected yet, please run. Um, it's also on the size of your space. So if I'm playing right here, I might not want 14 cards lined up all over my table. But if I'm playing um, in a group, not only might it be helpful for me, but it might be helpful for the other players uh, to have this like stable point of reference. Not only for traits, but for enemies and NPCs to be able to just grab that card and slide it over and show everyone. Now, I know that some GMs don't show stats. Uh, I believe that is wrong. Okay, I've spoken. I've said it. Let the hate flow. Let the hate flow through you. All right. So um, the, the coup de gras, which is uh, Dutch for the cup of grace, um, these were the two that I've wanted to talk about for a while here. So the first is the uh, Delve deck from BG... BPB, British Petroleum Bostwick. No, BPB. I forgot what that... Well, we could probably find it. So, uh, Dastardly Dungeons. Plumb the depths of the adventure with randomly generated dungeons with unique high magic themes, generators, and tools. Um, so, I've had this for a few months, I think, now. And there's like a little title card here. I had about 360 Kickstarter backers. So... You know, these information cards are kind of cool when you see how the dungeon is set up. I mean, you could probably intuit what this is going to look like without even me saying anything. So you have 42 different dungeon cards, and you can just sort of randomly put them out, and then each card will be able to connect to some part of another card. Now, this might not work as well. Probably got to keep them in one, one direction, upwards or downwards. Um, and basically build out your dungeon this way. And they are uh, have letters and numbers because there are different types of decks. And I believe actually one of these cards will show you some of the different types of decks. And if you're from BPB and you'd like a review or some table time for your other cards, uh, feel free to... I don't know. Email me and let me know. BPB, I'm sorry for saying the British Petroleum joke. Okay. Um, so once you go into a room, then you roll a 1d6, and it says what kind of counter encounter you have. Treasure. Make it a rat. Uh, and then you can use each of these cards, these two-sided cards. So these are traps. Um, and if you have a monster encounter... Uh, this is also the danger level of the dungeon, which is kind of a mod like a, a modifier that will uh, shift around some of the possibilities here. A theme could be for the room or the dungeon, and uh, example ideas on the back. A little instruction card, some example dungeons. Um, and, you know, obviously uh, it's not going to provide you with everything that you need to summon all of the, oh yeah, here's some other ones. So crawl cards, overland crawl. Um, I guess, yeah, if you want to like use that to go to the website, will that work like that? I don't know. Wanders of the wilds, factions of the frontier. Yeah, so they got a lot of different options. I'm sure they're going to make a lot more. Um, yeah, I'm just thinking though that there should be a treasure Roll a d6 on the encounter type table to fill in room. Some results have additional info on other cards. So I guess, yeah, for treasures, they might not have that card, but I bet you they have some deck that will give you that information. Um, so, I, you know, I think that this is uh, something I really should use more. I think this is one of the tools that makes it uh, uh, very easy to start imagining uh, moving yourself away from you know, having to buy uh, all of these different solo systems. And really, if you want to get to the nuts and bolts, if you're a person right now 
that does not have that like affinity for stuff like this does not bring you joy uh you're a person that gets pdfs you're a person that just will pull like the lore ideas out of a game without needing to get into the mechanics this and what we're going to talk about next are great tools for you um and because they have letters and numbers so this one is dungeon delve i think that's the name of the deck delve deck uh 42 if you wanted to keep a sheet with like information about the encounters, you could put DD42 and then whatever sort of encounter you wrestle up. And as you can see, this could, um, you know, have a different level of dead ends. Maybe you fill it out until uh, it is what filled in, finished. And for the dungeon size, this is a D3 card with dungeon size and if it's a short dungeon, it's 5 to 10 cards, medium is 10 to 15, and long is 12 to 25. And so I think that's pretty cool, right? You just say, all right, uh, right when you start, roll a d3. This is a medium dungeon. You, you roll out whatever, 20 cards, and then you get you get to work, right? And you put those cards, and you, you can either maybe set them all up uh, from the start and move them around to make a dungeon, or you can flip them one at a time and see what works. Uh, but either way, this is, this is really, you know, in terms of... Um, procedural generation, I think the cards like this and a lot of the other ways that we talked about using these cards, the real benefit is lowering this cognitive burden. If you have played um, any hex crawl or dungeon crawl solo games that require an enormous amount of generation before you're able to take the action, how you feel about that det may determine how useful these tools are. If when you do that, you feel the thrill of being like, yes, I get to populate another room. I get to find out another NPC's personality. I get to build three um, new enemies, right? Or if you're a person that's like, why can't there be a bestiary? Why can't there be just like these rooms predetermined or whatever it is? Um, this might be a good tool for you. I think Delve Deck combined with the Game Master's Apprentice deck, of which there are many different kinds now. Um, there's like a, I think a cyberpunk one and a sci-fi one maybe. Um, there's, you know, there, this one obviously is kind of like an old fantasy genre. I think this is the original and it actually comes with a PDF. You can get it on Drive Through RPG. I'll put the link below. Um, so this is Universal uh, Instructions by Nathan Rockwood. It's 30 pages and uh, right off the bat, we have all of the uh, labels, which I think, because when you first look at these cards, you're like, what the hell is going on here, right? I mean, it it looks nutty. Um, bad, no, even, no, good, yes. But when you break this down and look at how um, each of these pieces works, and it's listed here, and then you can go and it explains each one of these. So the difficulty generator, really easy. Um, now they recommend, or I guess in a lot of the ways they explain it, is putting out three cards at a time. And by the way, these cards are all double-sided. You put out three cards at a time because you don't wanna like use just what's on one card because if you pull that card again, you're gonna get the exact same scenario. Um, maybe I should give this a shuffle because I think a lot of the stuff might be a little similar here. And obviously for like, you know, sci-fi, cyberpunk, uh, stuff like that, they're going to have different names on there. They're going to have, you know, you don't want to be playing um, cyberpunk 2077 and you pick up a, uh, you know, a broad sword and some hay. Uh, although maybe that would finally help that game be fun. I'm just, just kidding, I guess. Uh, so we roll out three cards and we'll start with the first card. So... Um, this one, it has likeliness and odds. No, oh, that's terrible. You can't see that. Okay. Likeliness and odds. And so you'll say, oh, is this door locked? And then you'll determine what's the likelihood that that door in this dungeon is locked. Uh, I don't know. Could go either way. Even then it, then it, yes, it is locked. Right. Um, and then over here we have the dice roll, which is something that I honestly looked like looked like that uh, that decoder that Ralphie uses in Christmas Story to find out that 
little orphan Annie tells him to drink his chocolatey Ovaltine, and he says, son of a B, and that's the first time I ever heard that word, and I was like, oh, what? Kids can say that. Um, but basically what this is, and you probably, if you're, if, you're, if you're clever, you probably already figured it out, but this is, and let me move a little closer one second. Okay. These different shapes right here are the different dice. So on this card, it's like, do you need a D4? Well, your D4 rolled a one. Your D6 rolled a two. What is that? Your D8 rolled a seven. Your D10 is a five. Your D12 is a 10. Your D20 is 11. And then this is the percentile, right? So you can do like your your one your double digits and single digits. So this could either be 70 or 77. And then you look across the three cards and you have these random event generators and you can say, let me try to move this a little bit. Okay. These random event generators, you wanna go with like the first one, second one, third one. And so you'll say prevent arrogant chaos. <laughs> so, you know, maybe there's some chaos demon that is very haughty and wants to ruin the order and thinks that they can never be stopped and that chaos will reign and that, uh, yada yada um, whatever that could be and then you can also you know do it in the opposite order tension um, tension uh, aura enslave that doesn't work as well for some reason because oh okay I know why because the first the first word is a verb uh, the second word is a descriptor and the third word is a noun right so we would have to go bargain broken aura you know and uh this actually has fairly good instructions on like alchemizing those inputs and and try you know uh, recommending people not sort of just like say oh that's too hard i can't figure that out uh which i think is really in terms of the muscle that you can work for solo play that's one of the best muscles right there is not passing up those inputs opening up like you know it's kind of like when you fill up your lungs as much as you can and then you're like, okay, you know, right now I fill up my lungs. <gasps> okay. Now I'll fill up my lungs again, but then I'm going to take another breath. <gasps> right. And I could do that maybe twice more. You can always get like a little more breath in. And I think that when we get our input and it seems really bizarre, if we just kind of like loosen up our understandings of each of those words. And I, so in that way, I think this deck could be really good practice for that. Then these four are the senses. So like right here is an ear, an eye, a finger, and a poop. What is that? Oh, a nose. Um, and so what does it sound like? Grotesque, grisly chewing. Uh, you see dead sun bleached branches. Uh, it feels or you feel tired and irritated and there's some sort of deodorizing spray. And again, you probably want to take these from across cards so that you're not just like getting the same thing every time you pull that same card, because I think there are what, like, uh, how many cards, 58 or something like that. Um, and so you want, you know, you're going to get repeats. Well, there's 58 and they're two sided. I don't know if there's 58. It doesn't say, I had a little card up at the top that I think was like the instructions. It's, it's about the size of a playing card deck. All right. Um, and then on this line right here, uh, eight, this is tag symbols, right? And so this is uh, also something where, where I sort of divided up the printout for it because on the latter half of it, and maybe I'm wrong here, but the, yeah. So the tag symbols, uh, can give some like different interpretations of uh, these different things. Actually, that might be in the first part because those are ones that these ones probably have a pretty um, ubiquitous meaning. Like if you look at these, it's like a sun, a moon, a target maybe. Um, and so those ones you could probably do on their own. But I do, I thought that there was, if I'm not mistaken, where's that table? Yeah. Okay. So these tag symbols are what this could mean. You know, conflict if you get a sword, protection for a shield, etc. On the far right is this arrow. It's either an arrow or on some of them it is a like a sunburst or a dash. And that could be used for any sort of directional thing. 
right? So if you want to know what way the wind is blowing, if you want to know in what direction your grenade toss uh, failed, if you uh, want to know where an enemy is located relative to you, and then if it's like a sun, that would be a a sort of direct hit. And if it's a dash, it could mean a miss. And so, I mean, if you're, yeah, dash right there. If you're, you know, if you're using these cards, obviously, depending on what you're using it, that might be one that you have to look at the next card for or whatever context you're looking at. Okay. Um, and then this is NPC stuff. So right under that, you have belongings, you have a uh, catalyst or maybe their motivation and a location some names one of them is usually more masculine one of them more feminine and then one that can like fit in either category and virtue and vice and i think this may be one of the best tools on here um in terms of quickly summoning an npc right like sometimes well, <sighs> I guess one of the problems that I have or one of the things that drags me down while I'm solo playing is NPC generation is not NPCs usually are not interesting enough for me to spend five minutes. Right. Think about it if you're if you've played a, a, an RPG video game, you know, you walk around town, you click uh a person and they say something and some of them might give you some context some of them might have a quest for you can you go find my dog uh, some of them might sell some items but the majority of them say this kind of stuff like ever since the sheriff left this town has been the subject of so many goblin attacks Ooh, how are we ever going to protect our crop um, and you know obviously with uh, Max Edition of D and D, goblins are probably helping them plant the crops. I shouldn't have done that. Okay, but anyways, um, goblins are nice now. Ugh. All right. Anyway, so this is this is great to quickly summon up an NPC to get what I want, and then to have a little bit more of a background just in case they become part of my party, or they're going to be somebody who helps me with something, gives me something, becomes an enemy, whatever that might be. In the top right are the ones that I probably would not use as often. And this is the final pieces of this here is five. You have elemental symbols. Okay. That I could see myself using that, I suppose, you know, earth, wind, water, fire, and uh, Grand Funk Railroad. And the one above that is Norse runes. Um, and I would say... Norse runes are, they do include this. So I'm a little curious about this, actually. This might be, maybe I just didn't give this a chance because I didn't read through them. So let, let's try to look at one here. I usually bring these into the game when I want yet another different way to randomize the details, tone, or direction of something. By the way, I can't decide if I like it when people write in first person and in instructions but part of me feels like one of the reasons I have such a hard time writing certain instruction pieces is because I'm struggling to recase it in third person. And I start saying ridiculous stuff like, when one picks up the dice, one will roll. Uh, when an individual who is playing the game, it can just be like, uh, this is why I made this choice. This is why, okay, you know, this, I, uh, when I do this, I usually do X, Y, Z. All right, so let's look up one here. So we have this one that looks like an N. Hagalaz. Hail, weather, uncontrollable forces such as nature, the unconscious mind, crisis that comes before harmony. Um, in game, terrible weather or other natural disaster strikes, powers or ability are blown out of control. This could be cool, especially if you're more familiar with these, I think. Um, but, you know, if you wanted to, like, print this out, I could see this as a laminatable tool. Um, I'm trying to think of any symbols that might be more germane, that are more ubiquitous. But if this is like what this person likes and what, you know, is in their life and uh, if they, especially if they have any sort of Nordic background or an interest in this or anything like that, I think that's as cool as any other. And I'm trying to think, uh, because you, you also have these like symbols in the middle too, which are sort of uh, archetypical, uh, archetypal images. And then finally up here in the top left is, you know, the little uh, 
um, what are they like the drama masks, happy and sad? Those don't change. But what that is, that number right there, obviously you can use it for whatever you want, but it's a difficulty generator when you need a, um, a comparative or what would you say when you need a something more than a yes or a no. You need something that determines magnitude, I guess, is what I'm looking for. And so you're like, uh, how big is this crowd? Um, you know, one means it's tiny, just a few people, and 10 means it's like an arena show for Taylor Swift, a six. Okay, so it's like Halsey. <laughs> I'm being nasty. I don't even mean it. What if Halsey watches this? Halsey, I'm so sorry. Please like and subscribe. So yeah, you have a couple of options here, and I think um, you know if you've been if you've been following along, uh, there there isn't really anything to replace dice or whatever because a lot of these can be very well used in concert with dice. The point is to make your gameplay easier and and to make it fun, but also, and I, you know, I think I, I like using this word. It doesn't get used a lot. I like when things feel slick. Like I like when I'm able to just throw something out there and it just makes sense and it just gives me all the info I need and I'm just able to be like, damn, is that helpful? Is that like slick? I don't know any other way to say it, you know? Um, it just feels cool, and it's why I want those uh, Mutant Year Zero cards. I just want there to be, uh, maybe I'm GMing, and I say, okay, you open up this old box, and you get a book. Damn it. All right, let's just call it. Uh, have a great one.